Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. I'm also the creator of the Teach the Geek to Speak online public speaking course. You can learn more about it at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Dr. Zina Jarahi Sinker. I hope <laughs> that's kind of beautiful. But I got it. I got it. All right. You know, <laughs> wonderful. She is the Director General of the Advanced Material Pandemic Task Force. She's also a visiting scientist in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Vanderbilt University. I've heard the term visiting science before, but every time I hear it, I think to myself, how long is the visit? When do you have to go home? <laughs> when do you overstay your welcome? <laughs> you get your office, Neil. You know, that's that's a big perk. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, it's like, okay, you ain't got to go home, but you got to leave here. But <laughs> so I'm, I'm really interested to ask her about her background, about, about her being on this task force and how that came about. And of course, you know, I, we, I like to talk to people about their journey in public speaking. So we certainly will cover that too. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Dr. Sinker. Thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure. Wonderful. So from the bit of background research I did on you, I saw that you, you got your degrees in physics. So what was the motivation to, to study physics? Since I was a kid, I wanted to be an astrophysicist and a Bill Gates. So it was, it was a mixed bag. But I mean, I, I grew up reading science fiction books. So uh, physics was a no brainer. Oh, wow. Astrophysics, astrophysics and and Bill Gates, that's, that's quite the combination. I did want to be Bill Gates when I was a teen, so. Well, you're still alive, so there's still time. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it kind of um, tells you a little bit more about the choices that I've made in life. I mean, I did science for the sake of science and I, I did my PhD and I did my postdoc and I'm still a visiting scientist at Vanderbilt University. But then I really wanted to experience that entrepreneurial route as well. Uh, with um, with kind of those those dreams that I had of being Bill Gates, but for me, being Bill Gates wasn't about the money or being a billionaire. It was mostly about that hustle of of starting something in your garage and being able to turn it into something that is going to be impactful. So. Um, I, I, I did that. I started my first company when I was doing my postdoc, and then I transitioned that, um, and I started working more on some of the, I would say, unsexy parts of commercialization of nanomaterials, which is includes uh, policy, um, regulatory work, and standard uh, international standards development. And with that, I was running the uh, largest association of Wolf for Graphene, uh, NGA, and uh, I did that for a few years, and now I'm running a think tank and an international association on frontier materials. So you got my whole background now. Oh wow, that's, that, that's quite that's quite the that's quite the story in, in in such a brief amount of time. You know, you mentioned regulatory. I was just speaking to somebody yesterday, and I was telling them the story about a few years ago. A, a, a graduate student reached out to me from my alma mater, and he wanted to know more about regulatory affairs. He knew that I worked in product development at a medical device company. So I'm not exactly sure why he asked me about regulatory since I worked in product development and not regulatory. And I told him, if you want to go into regulatory, then you you want you want a boring job. That's why I want the more boring jobs. Right? A medical it's, device hard, it's needed. No, no, it is needed, you know, but yes, oh man, it is boring. <laughs> Yeah, but and and he, he didn't take my advice. He still went to regulatory, and I think he's still in regulatory. So what do I know? Maybe he, maybe he likes it. So, so you're right. People, people need to are do it. different, Neil. People are different. It's different things turns us on. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I, I shouldn't have put my own thoughts onto him like that. I suppose. Although, if anyone else were to ask me about regulatory, don't be surprised if I say oh, you might want to look at the product development. But uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, you did mention also that you, you got your PhD. And you know that's that's quite the accomplishment. What was the motivation to continue on after getting your undergrad to get a PhD? Uh, motivation was that I always thought that that's what I wanted to do. No, no reason. Seriously, since I was a kid, I just really wanted to have a PhD in physics. God knows why. Um, and I did, and it served me well. You know, I don't, um, I, I don't believe that getting a PhD is for everyone. 
but it does give you a certain amount of, of, of expertise that and analytical capabilities uh, that you can apply to other things. I remember that one of the people, uh, one of my advisors was telling me getting a PhD is like, you don't know how to swim and somebody just throws you in the water and say, okay, now learn to swim and survive at the same time. And it's a skill. It doesn't matter which pond you're thrown in. At the moment that you start learning the capacity and capability of getting the information where the information is not easily available and, and putting that together, analytically find a path around it when you are the, might be the only person in the world who is expert in that and being able to apply that later on, it's a skill that is really, there is no match for it. Um, so I, I, I encourage anybody who wants to, to exercise that skill to go and get a PhD, but also getting a PhD is not for everyone. Majority of people that I know that got a PhD don't use their PhD for the, the reasons that they, they got it in anyway, so. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that, Dr. Sinker. So I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday about that very topic. So she works as, a, her, her title is Professional Development Coordinator in a, in a bioengineering department. And so she basically, she helps students with getting that first job, she also is the liaison between the department and, and industry. And I was, <laughs> she says that during, you know, as part of her job, she often brings in the former, former students to talk to the current students about the work that they do. And the ones that, that got PhDs, you know, they'll, they'll talk about getting their PhD and the type of work that they do currently. And I'm always, I'm always thinking, I'm always kind of, when people talk about PhDs, I'm always kind of smiling in, in my head. Maybe I'm smiling out outwardly too, but what oftentimes what I'm thinking is just like what you said, a lot of people that get PhDs, they will tell you till they're blue in the face that the PhD that they that they got is useful in the job that they currently have. And that may very well be true, but in many cases, it's not true at all. <laughs> but they'll tell the students, oh, no, my PhD was worth it. But, but especially, and you know what, Often, oftentimes perhaps that's something you, you want to say to people that are halfway through the PhD because they, they may be in a, in a spot where I'm not sure I want to stay in academia. I don't want to feel like the, this PhD that I got was a waste of time. I'm already 50% done. So I, it makes sense to, to continue on and finish it. But what can I do with it afterwards? Is it something that I'm even going to use afterwards? So these PhDs that, that come back to the students say, yeah, you'll use it. You'll use it. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> and you can have more doctor in front of your, <laughs> your name. And you know, for, um, for minority, um, folks, uh, women, um, um, and, and a lot of the diverse communities that we have there, sometimes it is even going through that, uh, that process of PhD to get the authority to be able to say that I'm an expert in the field is important regardless of what field you go into. So if you are halfway through, please continue. You've already done half the work. Don't give up and, and finish it because it will give you an authority that nothing else can. And that has happened to me so many times. I mean, I, I used to, uh, to do a lot of policy uh, work. Um, and uh, when I would go to DC and I would be in these meetings and I am the boss and I sit down and we're having conversations and people think that my assistant is my, my boss uh, and uh, we're sitting there and it, it, this, this balance of power, just being able to see the name and saying, doctor, okay, well, now you have to take me seriously, even though what I'm talking about has nothing to do with my PhD in physics. So if you're halfway, please continue. Don't give up. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I certainly can see that. And I think it's actually kind of sad that you would have to think that having the PhD is, is what would require people to actually listen to you. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes it is. Yeah, that's, that's a shame. Hopefully that changes in the foreseeable future. So, you know, I mentioned in the in the intro that you're a, a director general, but I mean, you mentioned you know, briefly that you didn't start off in that place. So the what the, the work that you did up until you became a director general, how did that help you in becoming or to, I guess, get you ready for the role that you currently have? Good question, man. You asked you asked difficult questions, Neil. <laughs> um, how did it prepare me? I think that. What I've done through my life and also my journey after my PhD was that I chose unconventional paths. I didn't know what I was doing, but I said, you know what, something needs to get done, so I'm going to do that. And that's been a trend and a pattern in what I do. So um, 
starting my first company, I come from a very fundamental side of physics where even patents are unknown. So for, for me to start a company, I, there was nobody else in my department or in the building, the physics building, who actually had started a company. If I'd gone just, a, I don't know, a few feet further if in the engineering department, there would have been lots of folks who would start companies. But I was doing it in a, in a situation where there was really no paved path for me. And I just thought, you know what? Something needs to get done. I'm going to do it. And you suffer through it. And you learn so much. So I think every choice that I have made um, from, from the moment that I got my PhD was an unconventional cho choice. And um, <clears throat> people tell me, oh, I, it, it, getting a PhD is so difficult. You work so much. And I say, getting a PhD was a breeze compared to what I do these days. I mean, I went and getting a PhD would work normal hours. I mean, 10, 12 hours a day. Now they're my, my job and what I do, I sometimes work 16 to 18 hours a day and there are no days off. This is diff different, this is difficult. And that, that time in my PhD gave me the capacity of just relaxing and be able to think and expand. Um, and make those choices where I wouldn't be able to do now. Nice. You know, when you were when you were talking, Dr. Sinker, you're not the first person to have this, I guess, a, what would we call a non-traditional path to where you got. And, th and that's really why it's always interesting to speak to people like yourself. Because oftentimes, especially people, I think in the technical fields, you you start off on this path and you think that you have to stick up, stick to it. And, and kind of, kind of like what I was saying before, you get a PhD and you figure, well, I got to use it in some way. And if, if I don't, then it was a waste of time or, or was it? And maybe that's a question you're, you're continually, continuously asking yourself. So when I speak to people like you that, that started off someplace and then ended up somewhere that was not necessarily something that people could, would have thought would be the, the natural course or the natural path, I always find that really interesting. It just shows that you have the, the courage to to not, to kind of break away and, and do and do something different. So kudos to you for, for doing that, and kudos to others that are listening that have done the same thing. So I, you know, I also I, call it craziness. Okay, it's not <laughs> the, <laughs> the guts to be crazy and just do something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crazy, brave, maybe a little bit, middle, a little mix of both. Yeah, that's so, required. <laughs> so you know, I also mentioned in the in the intro that you're a visiting scientist. So as a visiting scientist, what exactly does that entail? <laughs> what a good question. Visiting scientists is a really great position to have because I still have access to my lab and whenever Vanderbilt needs me to look at some data or invite me to be on on, on, on a grant or, or be a part of an experiment, they, they can invite me and I can still have my affiliation with the university. I can be up to date in terms of what's going on in research, but my full-time job and what keeps me up every day is something else. So this is a path for those who go outside of academia and research, they're doing something completely different, but then they want to have that affiliation with academia and research, and they want to be still a part of some of the projects that is going on. This is an unconventional path. Another, I, would, I wouldn't call it unconventional, but an unconventional path of still being in academia and research and being able to go out there in the world and do something different as well. Was that always the plan to, to stay, you know, I guess, to keep that toe in academia? Great question, Neil. I never ever had a plan for anything. <laughs> this, is, this is a thing that I used to think that what is wrong with my brain that everybody else says my plan is to do this in five years. And I always wondered what is wrong with me? I never had a plan. I didn't know what I was going to do after my PhD. I didn't know what, I still do not know what I'm going to do in the next year or so. I don't know. And over the years, I've learned that there's no shame in that. People are different, that there are people who do not foresee paths in the future, but they, wherever they go, they do the best that they can, and they put their entirety of effort and energy into what they're doing, and then paths open up. So no, I had absolutely no, maybe there's a brain defect in my brain, but I had absolutely no way of, of thinking what I was going to do. Even like I said, right now, I don't know what I'm going to do next year, um, but uh, that keeps you open to opportunities, that keeps you evaluating everything that comes in, in front of you. The, the, the key for something like this and this attitude in life, if your brain works that way, again, people are very different, is that you do your all and your best in every situation. You know, uh, 
<laughs> if you have a if you have a, a brain defect, then then I have one as well. Because <laughs> I, I'm kind of the same way, you know. Good. See, we are we connected. We're, we're we're connected. So we're we're both both of us got problems. <laughs> no, I don't think it's a problem at all. What it what it really is, just as you mentioned, you just you're leaving yourself open to opportunities and you don't think just because I'm on this path now, if, if something else interests me, then the then why not go to, go down that path and, and see where it leads? You're, you're not, you're, you're, you, you, I guess the word would be flexible in, in what you do. So I, I really like that. I like that for myself. And it seems like you like that for yourself as well. If not, you probably wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> True. And I do think that I have a brain defect, which does not allow me to see the future necessarily. It's always fascinating when people say, but in 10 years, I'm going to be do doing this. I'm like, how can you think like that? I wish my brain worked like that, but it just doesn't. You know what? When a lot of those people say in 10 years, they'll be doing that. Ask them what they're, ask them that same question in nine years. Let's see <laughs> what the answer is. <laughs> you damn liar. <laughs> So, you know, I did mention also that you're, you know, you're currently a, a director general for this task force. So what exactly does that entail in, in, that, in that job? Um, that is an actually very fascinating job. So I run an, a think tank. Um, this is a task force um, on how do we use the materials of the future to help our world today. And that involves a very big part of the ecosystem. We work with different countries. So as an example, we work with the US administration on policy. We work in a government about the government of Spain and Gelotad of Catalonia and Barcelona City Hall. And we have an international event, which is called Puzzle X, which brings the bleeding edge of material science and frontier materials to look through the lens of sustainable development goals. So how can these materials, nanomaterials, quantum materials, metamaterials, biosilicon interfaces, these materials on the bleeding edge, how can they really contribute to the bigger picture of global prosperity within the, again, the SDG and Sustainable Development Goals um, framework of, of the United Nations. And that is a very exciting role because there is no set path. We work with a network of 20,000 uh, stakeholders in the field. We have 30 different country chapters and we do different things in different parts of the world. And every day brings new challenges and every day brings things, uh, exciting opportunities to, to take on, to again, showcase the real value of, 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 of material science in, in shaping human civilization. Is it difficult to get for certain stakeholders I guess as excited about the work that you do as, as, as you are? And if so, what do you do to kind of get them on board? Many, many times. Um, not everybody is always going to agree with you. That is the, the key is, I used to think that obviously if something is logical or rational, everybody has to, to get in line. That's not the case. That's not the case. Because ration and lo uh, rationality and logic for every pe person apparently is different. So the thing is this, <laughs> the thing is this, um, you're going to face so much opposition. Uh, there is going to be people, I mean, there are people who said that Airbnb was a stupid idea. So <laughs> look at this. And every person that has done some Something significant. There's probably 99% of people who told them that was stupid or was not going to happen. And if everybody agrees with you, you're not doing something right. Seriously. It's just if every if you are the darling of society, everybody agrees with you and if every you, you're playing it safe and that might be the choice for you. But if you are not afraid of getting your hands dirty and do something that ruffles some feathers and actually does something, creates momentum in life, you're always going to have people who do not agree with you. What you do in that path is sometimes you don't have to push it. A lot of people who told me, why would we be a part of that thing? We signed, we did an unprecedented thing. We wrote an open letter to the UN Secretary General on the behalf of the Frontier Materials community. And we had thousands of our stakeholders sign it. When we started doing that, um, a lot of people, big names in my field, to told me, this is a stupid idea. Why would anybody do this? Nobody's going to be signing this. And uh, we are scientists. Why should we even be a part of something like this? And over time, as these things got, got along, um, they came back and they signed and they said, can, why can I please sign this now? I said, okay, fantastic. Sometimes you just have to give it time. Just do what you're doing. The ones who are going to come back, they're going to come back to you. The ones that are not going to come back, maybe they're just not a part of your, your tribe. Let them be. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think you're right when, he, when you said that, you know, when it comes to, to being rational, I might be 
different things to different people. You know, <laughs> one plus one equals two. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so, you know, I started this whole channel. I started this whole podcast because of my own struggles having to give presentations in front of people. And it's, it started, it started when I was working this particular job, I had to give a presentation in front of management every month. And I wasn't very good at it, at least at first. So I was, I'm curious, when it comes to giving presentations in front of others, is that something you've always been good at? And if not, what'd you do to get better at it? You're not going to like my answer. I, <laughs> I think I've always been good at but it was it never it never scared me to stand up in front of the audience and talk. You know what scares me or it scared me and these days it doesn't have as much is smaller groups of people. Talking in a smaller group is more difficult for me than me standing on an, on, on a stage. Uh, so in in group meetings or in in places where boardrooms, et cetera, et cetera, that is more difficult for me to to talk because when I'm on the stage, I know this is my time. You are here to listen to what I have to say. But in a setting where you're sitting around with other people that could be interrupting you or that could be saying something and you want to be respectful, et cetera, et cetera, that one is more difficult for me uh, to navigate. Some people are really good at that. And some people are really good at public speaking. Again, everybody is different. But public speaking has been, it's, it's served me well. And I do a lot of that. Um, and I do it on really big, big stages as well as very small stages. So I, I, I talk whatever is aligned with our mission. If somebody from a student body asks me to come and give a talk, I will do that. And if somebody from a, the biggest uh, conferences in the world asks me to give a keynote, I go and do that. It, it doesn't it doesn't matter for me. It's a, it's a way for me to spread the message that we have. And every time that I have to prepare something like that um, to give a talk, um, I get to sit down and think about the story again. Also, I am one of those people who says story is a lot more important to presentation. So I usually give stories with well, like no with visuals, but no words on. on and I set the mood, mood, mood and the, th the tone um, by doing that. Um, so every time that I have to do that, I go for a walk and I start thinking and I discover so many cool things every time that I have to think about the subject again for a talk. Um, so I use these opportunities as a way of looking into the mission that we have, re, re looking at it, rediscovering things about it, because I'm trying not to tell the same story again and again. And you ask what is a good, maybe something that I've learned. Let me tell you one thing, and not everybody's going to have, be able to do this because the formats sometimes are very strict in terms of when you're giving a talk. But if you're in a position where you can and you are good, you know your topic, you are personable, you're just having trouble being on the stage as solo. Sometimes I, when they invite me to give a talk, I say, how about we do a fireside chat? And I have somebody else sit next to me where instead of me preparing a whole conversation where I have to fit it within 20 minutes and I don't have time to exactly know when I can finish it, I ask them here, Ask whatever you want uh, from me. And the audience responds even better. So if you're starting your journey and you have the fle flexibility of asking for the format, ask for somebody else to be on the stage with you as a fireside chat, uh, I don't know, buddy. Um, and they can ask you just, they can feed you questions, two or three questions, and you just go on. And you basically deliver whatever you want to deliver, but you don't have to, you can, you can, you can switch it, you can, you, you can pivot, you can, they can tell you that you're out of time. <laughs> uh, so that's one trick that I've seen that uh, works really well for me. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that's, a, I, that's, that's pretty interesting. And, you know, I've always been kind of curious about that whole term fireside chat. I, I've never been beside a fire. So maybe <laughs> <laughs> I never really thought about chatting beside them. But I, I guess there was a fire on this stage. That was really cozy and nice. <laughs> yeah, this is the start of, yeah, hopefully the, the fire department ain't around, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to the presentations that you have, to, uh, that you give in front of people, do you have, a process for putting them together? And if so, what is it? 
It depends on who, wh what what stage I'm talking to. Like I said, these days I do a lot of fireside chats. Again, I don't have any burns, but all you need is two chairs on the stage. And um, I do a lot of that because I want, I, when you're talking to different audiences, for example, if I get invited to talk to an AI community, okay, I'm a material scientist. If I have to sit down and really think about the presentation of how I do this thing, it would take me a very long time. And I, I don't have that luxury these days. So I ask them here, Ask whatever you want from me, the person who's going to be interviewing me. Ask me whatever you want, and I will I will answer on the stage. So in that capacity, I don't do a lot of planning in terms of putting something together. I start thinking about what does it really, this topic, what does it really mean for me, and prepare my, my methodology for it, for it. Really, what do I believe that there's going to be an intersection of AI and materials design? Okay, let me just think about that. And, and come with... To, through a, a, um, a kind of understanding that I want to have about the topic myself and then give the freedom to those. So for what I do these days more than anything, it's it's that format. But sometimes, for example, the TED Talks, et cetera, when I do that and something that is like a really important keynote that I have to deliver where I have to give a presentation, what I do is that I try to go into a go for very long walks. And I also go for driving or start thinking about it in the shower. Whatever, for, what works for me is my part of my brain that starts telling me, oh no, no, what about this? What about this? It dulls down when you're doing something. It's the principle of the shower principle, right? So uh, something needs to dull your senses so that you can see the bigger picture. When I try to do that, um, especially important talks, I have to look at the bigger picture and tell a different story because I can't keep telling the same story. To look at that angle, you have to be able to have that Zen moment to do that. And that's how I do it. I go for a drive, I go into, I go walk for a hike or in the shower as I'm thinking about different things, I start telling myself and I talk to myself. I talk to myself so much. Every time I'm preparing a talk, I'm constantly talking to myself. Sometimes my husband comes into the room and I say, I'm talking to myself. And so that for me is a method that works. Um, if you have to think about a new story, um, do something that allows you to see the bigger picture, whatever that thing is for you. And then for me, I talk and I say it many, many times and I rehearse it to the max. Meaning when you're giving a super important presentation, don't wing it. There is no winging when you're on a TED stage and they say it's 18 minutes or your talk will not be accepted at, at, at this. So for something like that, you rehearse, sorry, the shit out of it. And you say it as many times, you record yourself um, and um, you make sure that you understand that when you're on the stage, um, sometimes people have a tendency to talk faster. So you might finish with less time, but sometimes people talk slower or they have to, sometimes the audience react to something and that might cost you 15 seconds of saying, okay, okay, thank you, where people are laughing. That 15 seconds normally might be nothing. But when you're on a very important state, that 15 seconds is a lot uh, to, to be able to do that. So rehearse, rehearse rehearse. And I sometimes write for important um, talks. I write it down so that I know exactly what topics, what words I'm going to be using. But in most cases, I don't do that. But for the important ones, yes, you have to. Gotcha. Well, it seems like in with the exception of the, the presentations that require a bit more rehearsing, it sounds like your preference is there's the fireside chats that you would mentioned before, where someone might ask a question and it kind of cues you up to, to answer there's less preparation that's involved, which kind of makes sense considering that you're not the biggest planner. So <laughs> I am an, I'm an awful planner in the meaning awful meaning I am um, obsessive planner. I just do not plan for the future of myself, but everything. Do you see this background here? These yeah. are all plans for our next month. So. <laughs> well, this has been great speaking with you, Dr. Sinker. Thank you for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? LinkedIn, find me, Zina Jarahi Sinker, and um, I'm very responsive on LinkedIn as well. Excellent. Well, everyone, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson, founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals 
I'm also the creator of the Teach the Geek to Speak public speaking course. You can find out about it at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Sinker. Thank you, Neil.